But how appropriate to have a, uh, a joy and a sobriety as we look at this particular passage. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to John chapter 11. I'm going to read a long section. You're going to have to exercise self-control to stay tuned here. However, realize that uh, what I say after reading the Word of God is not nearly as important as my reading of the Word of God, because these are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So even if you fall asleep when I get done reading, listen to God's Word. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his, her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Then he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. So when they came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. 
Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. Our Father, fill this place with your glory and with your spirit. Many of us who grew up in the church, we know this account, but capture our heart again. Not just with the truth of Lazarus, but more importantly, with the truth of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So from this point forward, every time I read this passage or hear this passage, I'm going to have a little girl's voice in my head. Uh, A few weeks ago, as you know, we, uh, Chris and I and Dan and Eric, were at at Florida for general counsel. We've talked about that. I remember the clip that I played of the guy a few weeks ago reading the uh, the story of the blind man, a very dramatic reading of that section. Well, he read this section as well. And uh, it, was, it was great. And at one point when he got to that climactic moment when Jesus cries out, Lazarus, and this guy filled the hall. Now, this is a convention center, right? So there's thousands of people in there and lots of space in the back. And, and moms with little kids take their kids back there. We used to do it when our kids were younger and let them run around. And as long as they're not making a lot of noise, they can kind of uh, do what little kids do back there. So this little girl was prancing around in the back, just having a great time, but very well behaved, very quiet. And the whole place is just captivated by this guy reading this text or reciting this text. And he said, Lazarus! And this girl goes, Lazarus! <laughs> The whole place heard her, and and the guy caught himself, and he stopped, and he smiled, and then you could tell he quickly got back into character because he was about to lose it all. So from now on, I'm going to hear this little cute voice going, Lazarus, whenever I read this. And I just wonder, no doubt there were little kids around during the scene, I just wonder if maybe in the midst of all this heaviness and this seriousness, seriousness, if there's this little girl said, Lazarus. In mocking of, of Jesus, it was, it was precious. The story of Lazarus, you know this. If you were raised in the church, you've been a Christian very long, if you've ever read the Gospel of John, you can't read this account without being stunned by the fact that there was a man who died who came walking out of the tomb again. But the story is not about Lazarus. 
If you leave here today thinking about Lazarus, I have failed you. Because this story, like every other story in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that so clearly in this text. The setting, as I read, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, these were very close friends of Jesus. Does that stand out to you? Do you realize that even the disciples are not described with such affection? But here, this is the one Jesus loved, this man Lazarus, very close friends. And Mary and Martha, you can tell by the, by the interchange here, this was, the, the, these were not just followers of Jesus. These were very close friends of our Lord. And now Lazarus comes down with some kind of illness, and he's about to die. So Mary and Martha do what all of us would do. They send word to Jesus, who's a couple days away, saying, our brother Lazarus, your good friend Lazarus, he's knocking on death's door. What's the expectation? Jesus will come and he'll heal him. Jesus has been healing others. Of course he's going to heal his close friend. That's the expectation. But did you catch how the story is told here by John? It says, when Jesus heard, this is verse 4, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he made this statement to his disciples. This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Like every other situation, every other story, this story, this, this, this disease that Lazarus has is to glorify Jesus. Now, we've been here already in the Gospel of John. Remember, a few weeks ago, we looked at the man who was born blind. And we talked about how this man lived, we don't know exactly, but 18, 20 years, never being able to see anything, completely blind from birth. It's not like he lived his life for a while and then his eyes started deteriorating and he became blind so at least he had memories of what he saw. No, this man was born never having the ability to see anything. And the disciples asked him, Lord, was it his sin or his parents' sin that is the cause of his blindness? And Jesus said, neither. This man was born blind so that I could come and display my power and my glory. Remember we talked about Job in that message. How Job has good life. Everything is going his way. He sang the song, no doubt. Everything is going, right? Sing that day in and day out. And then suddenly everything is taken away from him. He doesn't know why. He has no clue. What we know that he didn't know was there was a dialogue going on in heaven between God and Satan. And God turned Satan loose and said, do whatever you want to do to my servant Job. Job didn't know any of that. From his perspective, life is good and now it's not. Why? So that God could display his glory. And we talked about how as much as we think the, the story being told is our story, it's not our story. We are simply the supporting cast for the main character of every story, and that's Jesus. The scripture has to remind us of this over and over again because we so naturally shift into the mindset that the story, the big story, is my story and your story. It's not. But we live in a culture that tries to convince us it is. I mean, think about what's going on in the political landscape right now. You've got one side of the aisle that is so wrapped up in making sure that you know it's all about you. It's all about you. Everything is about you. Your ethnicity, your background, your race, your preferences, whatever. If anybody is daring to say you shouldn't do something or not give you what you want, then you should throw a fit, you should sue somebody, and raise a big stink. Then we've got the other side of the aisle that's saying, no, it's not all about you individually, but it's all about you as Americans. America is the end-all, be-all. We can very easily get swept away into nationalism. 
And Jesus, reigning from heaven, says, you're both wrong. It's not about you as an individual, and it's not about any nation on earth. This universe exists for the glory of Jesus Christ. And to the the extent that we ever lose sight of that, we're committing idolatry. Everything is about Jesus. This situation with Lazarus, is so that Jesus can be glorified. That's what he says. He says to his disciples, this is not going to end in death. It's going to end in my glory. Then, I read this on purpose, a certain way to try to draw, you out, draw it out, and I don't know if you caught it, but verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved these three people. What's the first word of verse 6? So? Some of, most of your translations say, say so. One of the, your translations says yet. The Greek word is therefore. Now imagine this. Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Therefore, when he heard he was sick, he stayed two days longer where he was. Does that make any sense to you? So someone is dying and you have the antidote. Someone you love is dying and you have the potion that will heal them. And out of love for them, you go the opposite direction instead of showing up and giving them the antidote. What kind of friend is that? What kind of savior is that? What kind of love is that? I could come heal you, I'm staying put for two more days so that you will die. That's what it says. Therefore, because he loved them. Well, how do we make sense of that? Because there was something more important for Martha and Mary and all of the disciples. There was something more important than Lazarus staying alive. What was more important? that they believe in Jesus. When hard things come, when we stop singing the song, everything's going my way, when the Lord brings really, really difficult situations, there is something more important to God than our relief. What's more important? That we trust Jesus that he is glorified. Therefore, he stayed away and let Lazarus die because he loved him. So then he has this little dialogue with his disciples. We're going to go back to Jerusalem now, to Judea area, and the disciples say, Lord, did you forget what happened in chapter 10? They want to kill you there. And Jesus says, basically, this whole business about walking in the light and all that, basically, I'm the light of the world, and it's still daytime. If you walk in the night, that's when you trip and fall, and nighttime's coming. But right now, when I'm here, it's daytime, and we can see clearly, as long as you're with me, it's going to be okay. I'm not afraid to go down there and face them. They can't take me out until I say they can take me out. That's basically the interchange that happens there. He says, we've got to go because Lazarus has fallen asleep. And just like we've seen over and over again in the Gospel of John, Jesus says something on the spiritual plane, and they see it only on the purely literal plane. Jesus is sleeping. I mean, Lazarus is sleeping. He's sick. That's a good thing, right? He's going to rest up. He'll probably recover. Jesus scratches his head. I know it doesn't say that in English, but in the Greek it's there. He scratches his head. It's like, duh. He's dead. Lazarus is dead. And verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you will believe. 
again, we think, what? Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there to heal him. I'm glad we were two days removed and that we waited two days longer so that he would die so that when you see what I do, you'll believe. Do you realize what Jesus is saying here? To show these people and even his disciples his glory, he did not prevent the suffering of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Mary and Martha had to go through the trauma of watching their brother die. Lazarus had to go through the trauma of dying. And Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there to spare them all the suffering because there's something more important than being spared suffering. It's believing in Jesus. So he says to his disciples, I'm glad I wasn't there so you can see what I'm going to do and then you'll believe me. But it's time to go. Let's go. And Thomas, who's later called the doubter, said, all right, guys, let's go with him. If he's going to die, we might as well die alongside. Let's go. So they went. So Jesus came. He found that, the, that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. That's mentioned twice in this text. Did you catch that? He says it here and says it later. That's important. In the Jewish culture, the rabbis taught that for three days after someone dies, the spirit would hover over the body. And there was the possibility that the, the, the body could be resuscitated and the spirit would go back in. But after the third day, nobody believed there's any chance of this person coming back to life. And, and it's the kind of idea, there are stories that are told uh, my dad used to tell the story of his uncle um, who died out in, in, a, in a pond. He had a heart attack and died. And for those of you that don't know, my dad uh, was born in 1922, so uh, I know I look great for a 60-some-year-old. Um, <laughs> all right, never mind. Anyway, my, my, my dad was born in 1922, so his uncle, this would have been in the late 1800s. And back then, they didn't have funeral homes. They didn't do funerals the way we do. They would just put them up in the house, and people would sit up all night because there was just this sort of superstition, you're not supposed to let the dead be alone. And so my dad tells a story when he was a boy of his uncle dying, and they brought him into the house, and then in the night, middle of the night, he got up. Apparently he had passed out, they all thought he was dead, something about the cold of the water made him look and appear dead, and then he could, can you imagine what that would be like, <laughs> sitting up like, uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that kind of stuff happens, there are stories of that happening, and there was a Jewish belief here, but nobody in this culture, after four days, thought there was any chance of this person not being all the way dead forever. So twice as is mentioned that he's, he's been dead four days, so that everybody knows. This is, by the way, uh, why Jesus stayed away to the fourth day. So that it's clear this is not, th there's no hope for Lazarus. He's gone. So he comes to Bethany near Jerusalem. Martha comes out to meet him. Now here's, we're left to do a little bit of interpretation because we don't know the tone of what's being said here. It's kind of like what we saw earlier when the disciples said to Jesus, where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, do you want to go away too? Everyone else had gone. Everyone left Jesus. And he's just sitting there with his 12 disciples. And he looks at them and says, are you going to go too? And they said, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We don't know if that was a profound statement of, of belief. Ah, we're not going anywhere. Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Or if they were like kind of desperate, <laughs> like we would like to leave, but you're our only hope of eternal life, so we're sort of resigned. We don't know, because we don't have the tone. We don't, we don't know that. Well, same thing here. Martha and Mary both come to Jesus, and they say the same words. And we don't know for sure 
what their mindset was. One possibility is they are rebuking Jesus. Jesus, you know, and we know, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't be dead. You could have stopped this. It's possible. I don't think so. I don't think so. I can't prove this, but this is what I think was happening. Mary and Martha and the rest, as they're watching their brother die, of course they're talking about all this. In fact, the, the fact that they use the same words, they both say, Lord, if you'd been here, he would not be dead. Of course they were talking about this. Oh, if only, if only the Lord had been here. If only Jesus were here. Quick, we gotta, we gotta send, send a messenger because if Jesus were here, he could heal him. And then Lazarus dies. And as they're weeping, as they're, they're sorrowful, they're saying, oh, if only Jesus had been here, he could have stopped this. He could have healed him. And when Martha comes out to Jesus to say this, what I think was going on, I think she's, she's crying. She probably needs to blow her nose. She, she is overcome with sorrow at the death of her brother, but she wants Jesus to know, we don't doubt you. We don't doubt you, Jesus. We have heard your teaching. We are convinced of who you are. And as much as our heart is bursting within us right now in grief, Lord, we want you to know we don't doubt you. You are the Christ. If you had been here, we are absolutely certain you could have kept him from dying. I'm persuaded this is a sorrow-filled, tear-filled confession of faith. We don't doubt you, Lord. We wish you'd been here. We don't understand why you didn't come sooner, but we don't doubt you. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Martha says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. We know she doesn't think he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead because when he actually goes to the tomb, she's, she's the one that says, Lord, in the King James, he stinketh. <laughs> no, don't roll that tomb away. No, 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 that stone away. No, 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 no. She had no expectation. What she's saying is, Lord, we have heard your teaching." And here's what you've taught us, and we believe you. Everyone whom the Father gives to you, you will raise him up on the last day. We know that. We believe that. We believe, even among our, um, in the midst of our tears, we believe that we will see our brother Lazarus again someday because you will ask God and God will give him to you and you will raise him up. Isn't this exactly what we do in funerals? As you know, within the last 22 months, I buried my mom and my dad. And I preached the sermons at my mom's funeral and my dad's funeral. And it's hard. And what am I saying to my family? What am I saying to myself? As I fumble through words and fight back tears, the most important thing I want to say to my brothers and sisters in Christ is, we're going to see mom again. We're going to see dad again. And in those moments of great sorrow, we are still saying, but this is not the end of the story. What I see is a dead body. But I believe God will raise my mom up and I will see her again. And God will raise my dad up and I will see him again. I believe that's what Martha is saying here. Lord, and I know we believe you, we trust you. Even now, if you ask God will give you my brother Lazarus and you will raise him up on the last day. Jesus says, yep, 
your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now at this point, Jesus says, yes, that's true. And you're very, very close to the center. You ever play darts? You know, you're throwing darts and you've got the concentric circles. And so often you hit it almost bullseye, but you're just on the periphery at times. And that's the difference between like 100 points and 50 points. And it goes out from there. Jesus is saying, you're throwing darts here and you're so close to that bullseye, but not quite. Yes, yes, of course your brother will rise again, but I've got something else in mind. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Can you imagine that? This man standing before you, not just saying someday the dead are going to come back to life, someday I'm going to bring these dead people back. I am resurrection. That's a big statement. I am life, Jesus said. What does he mean by that? It means I am so closely associated with coming back to life and living eternally that I am that. It'd be kind of like, raise your hand if you've ordered anything off of Amazon.com in the last month. Oh, come on, you know you all have. <laughs> Prime Day was last week, right? Who's the uh, vice president of Amazon.com? Anybody? That's what I thought, nobody knows. Jeff Bezos, everybody knows, right? If Jeff Bezos were to get up here and say, I am Amazon, we'd all say, yeah, I'll get that. Because he's so associated. He's the founder. He, he's everything. Uh, Facebook. Who's the founder of Facebook? Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg. You all know that name. If he got up and said, I am Facebook, you'd say, yeah, that's, that's fair to say that. And then you'd have a few other things you'd like to say to him too, right? <laughs> About our privacy statement. Anyway. When Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life, I, he's so associated with life everlasting and with resurrection, he can simply say this, I am that, so much so that he says, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then he ratchets it up even higher. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Uh, the physical, temporal plane, we're all going to die. But Jesus says, because I am resurrection and life, if you believe in me, it's going to be as though death doesn't exist. You will live forever if you're attached to me. Do you believe this, he says? What if he showed up right here and looked you in the eye and said, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Some of you have been through this. When you see your mom and your dad put into the grave, you have to ask yourself the question, do I believe this? Because if it's not true, I never see mom and dad again. If it is true, they're way ahead of me. And I want to get there. Love Martha's response. Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are the one that we've been waiting for who is to come into this world. In the midst of all of her grief and sorrow, she doesn't doubt who Jesus is. You are the one.
but then she just can't take it anymore. And she runs off. Mary, teacher, I want to talk to you now. <laughs> so Mary comes, and she says the same thing. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Again, I think just reflecting on their common discussion, we believe in the Lord. We heard what he said. We heard everything. We've seen what he's done. We don't doubt him. So Mary gets up and goes to see him, and everyone follows her, thinking that she's going to the tomb to weep. Now, there's a huge crowd here. Friends, maybe other family, but also professional mourners. It was required by the Jews in this day that when someone died, you had to hire a minimum of two flautists and a professional weeper. If you were wealthy, it would usually be a bigger entourage than that. More, and, and a flout, maybe flute doesn't get it for you. Think bagpipe in our day, right? Bagpipes sort of have that somber, you hear, you know, Amazing Grace played by bag, bagpipes at funerals. It, it's that feel, that dirge, that, that, the time of mourning. That, that's what they did, and they would follow around, and there would be professional weepers. They weren't insincere. That wasn't the point. It was their cultural expression of the sorrow of death and to make sure that they, they all respected the, the, the severity of death, there would be somebody who would weep and wail out loud. But if you had wealth, you would hire more people. Well, we know that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were rich because of the oil that Mary used to anoint Jesus' feet. So this was a large group, and we have no idea, but these were wealthy people. Big entourage of, of folks wailing and lots of uh, bagpipe type sounds and things. And they all follow her and, and they're weeping. And of course, there's dialogue going on about Jesus could have stopped this and why didn't he stop this and oh, I loved him. So now we come to the heart of everything. Verse 33 Jesus saw Mary weeping, Jesus saw the Jews weeping. And the end of verse 33 says, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. That is a troubling translation. Troubling doesn't get at the heart of this Greek word. Better word would be, Jesus is outraged. This is deep agitation righteous indignation. Jesus is not sad here. Jesus is mad. That's what the word means. It says it again a couple of verses later. What's he mad about? Well, some have said, oh, he's mad at Martha and Mary and their faithlessness, or the other Jews and their faithlessness. I don't think so. Here's the setting. Jesus is a human, right? He's God, but he's also man. Jesus walks up, and he hears and sees Mary and Martha pouring out their heart in sorrow at the loss of their brother. All of these other people weeping and wailing. All of the, the sounds being made by the flutes and things. People grieving People disbelieving, fighting going on. I believe Jesus looks and hears all of this, and he is angry at the effects of sin. Death is described as the last and greatest enemy, right? Where did this whole thing start? In the garden. Jesus created this fantastic world, this amazing earth, and it was perfect and then the serpent slithers up to the woman, deceives her, she leads her husband into sin, and the two of them rebel against God, and death enters the world, and from that day forward, devastation, destruction of every kind, spiritual and physical, is the story of planet Earth. And I believe Jesus here experiences the sorrow and the grief, and it makes him furious at what sin is doing to his world. A few years ago, my, uh, my son was, in fact, it was the last time I preached this sermon. 
I, I preached this sermon on Easter several years ago, and it was a Saturday. I, I was doing sermon prep on Saturday, and I was thinking, how can I illustrate this concept? And I was pondering, and, and Gabe comes in, and uh, he had been playing at the uh, local uh, little park in our subdivision that had basketball courts. And, and Gabe comes in, and he's just got this irritated look on his face. And I said, what's up? He goes, Nick. All of you have Nick in your neighborhood. He may be called by a different name, but you have him. He's the kid that destroys things just for the fun of destroying things. So we've got this basketball court, and my kids and the Jarrett's and others spend hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, all summer long enjoying the, the basketball court. And Nick and his buddies, and they were older than, than Gabe and his friends, and, you know, it's one of those basketball hoops that you can put up and down so that guys like me can feel our glory and dunk at about the five feet level. And then you can put it up where it belongs. And they were just jacked the thing back and forth until finally they broke it. And they'd hang on the rims and break the rims. And Gabe had saved up and, and bought a net to replace the old one with his own money. He'd saved up and put it on there. And then they came and just ripped it down, all for just the, the sheer fun of destroying things. They got nothing out of it, right? They can't use the basketball court either. This is the heart of vandalism. Vandalism is just doing evil for the sake of doing evil. At least when you steal something, you get something. Children, listen to me. <laughs> I'm not saying it's ever okay to steal. Don't hear that. But at least there's a return on your investment. There's something you get out of it. Vandalism is just pure wickedness. I like to destroy things. And Gabe's telling me the story... And inside, I'm getting angry at Nick. I'm thinking, is there any chance he's 18? <laughs> I wanted to hurt Nick, children. Not in the way you think. Well, maybe the way you think, but I wasn't going to do it. And then I realized, oh, that, uh, that's the Lord giving me an illustration for tomorrow. That's a very minor thing compared to the destruction of this beautiful earth and mankind. And I think Jesus here sees the sorrow and the pain and the suffering, and he is furious at the destruction that sin has brought in this world. He says, where have they laid him? They take him. Verse 35, everybody who's ever done sword drills, everybody who's ever had to memorize scripture, We've memorized John 11:35. Jesus wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. We love to memorize that one. But don't lose the significance. Jesus is joining the rest in weeping, but his weeping is not out of sadness. He's angry at the destruction of sin. I know for me, at least, there's no way I can fathom Jesus crying over Lazarus in and of himself. I mean, if I had the power to raise my dad out of the casket... When we were there at the funeral in January, and everybody's weeping and wailing and crying, and it's a sad time, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to raise him from the dead. You know? I, there's no way I could have cried in that moment. Like, yeah, go ahead, put him in the ground, put the dirt on him. Yep, yeah, oh, I know, here, here's a tissue, here, here. It'll be fine, it'll be fine. Because I know I'm going to raise him up. I don't think Jesus is weeping over Lazarus, he's weeping over the destruction of all of this. Same word occurs in verse 38. Jesus, again, deeply moved or agitated or outraged, came to the tomb. He says, remove the stone. Martha says, no, no, Lord, it's going to stink to high heaven here. It's been dead for four days. And Jesus said, did I not say to you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? Now, let's be real here for a second. If Jesus showed up to your house this afternoon, how many different times would he say to you, did I not say? How many things has Jesus said to you and to me and we doubt him? And he'd say, did I not tell you? If you read through the New Testament, the Gospels, this phrase is on Jesus' lips over and over and over again, oh, ye of little faith. Why don't you believe me? The late R.C. Sproul used to say, 
Believing in God is easy. Believing God is where it gets hard. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. We've already had this conversation, Father, and I know you hear me, but I need to make sure that everybody else knows that you've heard me. Now, Jesus is not doing what we preachers often do. You know, we preachers often preach at you while we're praying, especially if we forgot to make the last point, so we come up to close in prayer and we, we preach that last point. We preach at you, and that's why the prayers go on for five or ten minutes sometimes. Jesus is not doing that. He really is seeking to convince all the hearers that the Father sent him. Believe me. Trust me. So, Father, I'm saying this. You always hear me, but because of the people standing, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out, not with a gentle voice, not in monotone. He cried out, it says, with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come forth. Someone has said it's a good thing that Jesus was specific. Or else every tomb in Judea would have been emptied. This is the same one who said, Let there be light. This is the same one who screamed at the storm, said, peace, and the winds died down immediately. And this is the one who is the resurrection and the life, and he said, Lazarus, you get out of that tomb. Lazarus had no choice but to obey. Can somebody let me out of this, please? They took off the wrappings, and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Ah, what a story. But here's the thing. Lazarus had to die again. And Mary had to die. And Martha had to die. And the 12 apostles had to die. And all the Jews who are watching this had to die. And we are all going to die. The question for us is the same as the question for Martha and Mary. Do you believe? Everyone who believes in me, Jesus says, will, die, will live even if he dies. Our hope is not in this world, beloved. It is not in this world. Your story, my story are not the big story. And God has not promised us to relieve us of suffering in this life. In fact, just the opposite. He's promised us affliction. But that's where our hope is forged. Do I really believe that Jesus is the big story? That By his grace and kindness, if I do believe that, someday I will join him in a place where all pain and suffering is gone. Brother Steve covered this very well in the Sunday seminar this morning, talking about we must be ready, and then someday the next age begins, and it's all wonderful. But for right now, the question is, do you believe this? It's the difference between eternal death and eternal life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the irony of this story that you came to a place where your life was threatened in order to raise a man from the dead, but he would die again and you would join him in death. And just like Lazarus was raised, you would rise again. And both of those 
are evidence for us that death is not the end of our story. We too will rise again. And it's only true because of you, Lord. In Christ alone, all hope is found. I pray that we all believe that, that we live lives of hope and faith You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are the one who is to come into the world.